Welcome to the African International Mediation Week. Today is the third day of December in the year 2020. This is the fourth day of this African International Mediation Week. And this is our evening session at 8 p.m. Our evening session today at 8 p.m. is focused on collaborations and networks societies and associations. And our guests for this session is Mediate BC in British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada, with a case study of the Mediate BC, how they run the organization as practitioners. This is part of the theme of the African International Mediation Week to re-equip for the emerging world of mediation practice. Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. God bless you. My name is Wangari Kabiru, Convina Wasiliana Hub. Welcome to our evening session. Today is 8 p.m. on the third day of December in the year 2020. And this is the African International Mediation Week and Strategy Conference. Today is the fourth day of the African International Mediation Week, and we are delighted today to be hosting Mediate BC uh, from Vancouver, Canada, to be able to learn more about their work. So we will start off with the Kenyan national anthem in Kiswahili. Wimbo wa taifa, e mungu nguvu yetu, ilete baraka kwetu, haki iwengao na mlinzi, na tukae na undugu, amani na uhuru, raha tupate na ustawi. So once again, I welcome you to our forum today. So today we have an, a special international masterclass uh, in a very unique way. And it is part of the theme that we have to re-equip for the re-emerging world of mediation practice. So our topic for today is on mediation networks and that's collaboration as practitioner organizations, which could be societies, associations or other models. And we have a case study of Mediate BC uh, British Columbia, uh, Vancouver, Canada. So our international speaker for today is Sharon, Sharon Sutherland, who is the Director of Strategic Innovation at Mediate BC. Uh, she, uh, Sharon is a mediator, a lawyer, a trainer, and my most exciting part is she's a game designer. And so I'm very excited about that part uh, because we share that together. I'm delighted also to mention that uh, uh, Sharon is uh, uh, one of the recipients of, our, of the Wasilian Hub 2020 Mediation Advancement Citation Award uh, in recognition of her support in the design and development of the African International Mediation Week. So we are really delighted that she's also a speaker at our forum today. So the way we will run this session is that uh, we will invite Sharon uh, to speak to us. We also have a special guest uh, who is the chairperson of the Mediate BC. We will also get to hear from her, Julie Dawn. And we will start off with uh, Sharon Sutherland, who will be uh, giving us the presentation. After Sharon is complete uh, between herself and uh, Julie, then we will be able to have uh, Angela Munga Mwadumbo, who is from the Law Society of Kenya Nairobi branch, speaking to us on the Court Annex Mediation Bar Bench Committee, which she convinced of the Law Society of Kenya Nairobi branch. When we are complete, we will open up for uh, discussions and anyone who has comments or views, we will give, uh, have the opportunity to be able to share in, uh, in them. When we conclude, we will invite uh, at least four of our practitioners to kindly summarize because as an African Mediation Week, we are looking for strategies, tactics that we can be able to take away from each of our sessions. So allow me uh, to kindly invite uh, Sharon Sutherland, Director of Strategic Innovation at Mediate BC, to kindly take us through the next part of this session. Sharon, good morning to you. Good evening to us. Good morning to Julie and uh, and good evening to everybody there. It, it's, yes. it's absolutely a pleasure to join you here. Um, Julie and I, I'll just be clear, will be um, co-presenting this session. Um, we, uh, we work together and we have 
quite different roles with the organization and we've been there for different amounts of time. So you'll be hearing from both of us um, throughout and we'll have a bit of a back and forth. Um, where I do want to start, though, is, um, you know, I, I appreciate that that um, for you, one of the traditional openings is clearly doing the national anthem at the beginning. For us, it's it's an appropriate practice for us in Canada to acknowledge the land that we are presenting from. Uh, part of that is is real. It's very significant um, for us to do this because we are in the process of working through a difficult and challenging truth and reconciliation process. Um, recognizing the truth of the colonial um, impacts of uh, colonization on our country and on the indigenous peoples here and seeking some form of reconciliation going forward, which demands that we acknowledge at all times the truth of the, the damage done to indigenous peoples by, the, by colonization. So I, will, I would like to start by acknowledging that I am presenting from the traditional lands of the Tawasan people one of the few First Nations in British Columbia who did enter into a treaty agreement only very, very recently um, with the provincial and federal government. And Julie, I don't know if you want to speak at that point before we get going. Thank you. Um, so Julie Dom, I am an Indigenous person in Canada, so I am Wet'suwet'en, but I am coming to you from our neighbor's territory, the Stella'aten, and uh, North Central British Columbia. And we are both unseated, so we have not signed treaties with the government um, and consider ourselves sovereign people in, in the province of British Columbia and, and the nation of Canada. Um, and uh, so I have been um, a guest on the Stella Tan people's land for about 25 years because my husband's family is from here and this is where we have raised our family. But thanks for that introduction, Sharon. Thanks. So um, just we'll talk a little bit more about our roles in the organization as we go forward. But I, I thought that it would be helpful to just say that that both Julie and I have had uh, a lot of different roles with the organization over the years. Um, we've been involved. Um, I've been involved since the beginning. And so as we talk a little bit and give you a little bit of history of how Mediate BC came to be, um, I'll probably do a bit more of the talking at the front end of things. Um, Julie, when she became involved, became involved quite heavily in quite a number of different projects. And so as we get a little further into the history, um, Julie will tend to take over from me and talk a little bit more about those initiatives. And of course, at this point, I do want to acknowledge that, that um, Julie is the, uh, the chair of our board of directors, so is a very significant part of guiding and leading the strategic vision for the organization at this point. Um, in, we, were kind of, we were invited um, to talk about this really as a case study um, and a case study in the ways in which mediators can come together and collaborate, um, collaborate with other groups and organizations in order to develop mediation, in order to develop collaborative decision-making processes more generally. And so I'm gonna share my screen. I've got a few notes that will probably make it a little easier to follow along with us. And as, as we go, um, we'll just talk about, first of all, we'll be talking a little bit about the history and formation of the society because that really taps into how did we get together? What was the collaborative approach? How many organizations were involved in it? Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we're also gonna share some of the more significant projects that we've been involved in. Um, the society has been around for 22 years. So we're certainly not gonna talk about everything that the society has done in the last 22 years. Um, but we'll highlight a few of the things that were particularly large initiatives that we were engaged in that have had um, particular impacts on the way in which we, um, we engage in our own um, mediation practices here in British Columbia. Um, and then we'll be talking kind of our current focus and strategic aims where we're going. Um, I am not going to be able to, with my screen share, be able to monitor chat, but I do want to invite you to, if you want to be adding any questions to the chat as we go, to do so and, and ask Julie to just be monitoring so that we can, uh, we can stop and answer any of them if, they're, uh, if they fit particularly in a particular time, and otherwise we'll certainly circle back and answer any. So society history is a bit... Um, it, it's a bit interesting in that we originally started as two different societies. 
there was a relationship because both of them involved um, support from the Ministry of Attorney General. But the BC Dispute Resolution Practicum Society is the one that I was involved with initially in 1997. And that was brought together a huge stakeholder collaboration. Essentially a group of, of um, mediation training organizations, people at training organizations got together and said, we are not able to get our mediators who are trained any kind of practical experience with the consequence that we have hundreds and hundreds of fully trained mediators in British Columbia who can't work uh, because anytime that they seek to advertise their services, somebody will say, how many mediations have you done? And they'll say, I've done several role plays, uh, but they had not actually conducted any mediations. So it was seen as a huge gap in the training continuum for the training organizations. And they got together, but they did more than that. They reached out jointly as a collaborative. So working together rather than competitively with each other, um, they reached out to the provincial court and to the ministry of attorney general and uh, talked about the ways in which they might be able to get a mentored experience for trained mediators in the, what was then the, our small claims program. Um, they, in reaching out to the provincial court, um, they were able to talk about the ways in which they could help reduce backlogs that were forming, and there were really significant backlogs in the um, small claims court at that time. In a couple of our larger registries, it would take um, quite a bit over a year to get to trial um, in matters that were under $10,000. Um, some of those would be much, much under $10,000, and so the delay was seen as a significant challenge to access to justice in our province. So the court was enthusiastic about the possibility of dealing with the backlog. The Ministry of Attorney General was beginning to look at the ways in which mediation could become part of legislation in other areas, all throughout different types of things. Could, it, could you have mediation respond to some of the access to justice crises um, with any of the other ministries in any other areas. And if you could, how would you refer to mediation unless you could um, guarantee that there was gonna be a qualified pool of mediators in order to serve the, the public? Otherwise, what you were doing was sending people to what would be a private process um, and there could be all kinds of challenges and difficulties. Um, from the government's perspective, it was a concern around whether people's rights might be um, impacted adversely if there were a requirement that people go to mediation. Um, so creating a qualified pool was extremely desirable to the Attorney General at the time. And we also brought in a bunch of different groups, um, mediator associations that were membership organizations of mediators getting together and, uh, and forming um, collectives in order to promote the use of mediation in the province. Um, and uh, some of the lawyer or associations were also very interested in the development of what would become dispute resolution. So that was, as you, as, as you can probably tell, it was a very large collective and a collective that met for something like three years in various configurations before getting the funding um, through a law foundation grant to develop a specific program for the um, provincial court. And so it launched as a pilot project, it launched entirely as a practicum, and, uh, and it launched in 1998 at the same time the society incorporated as a society under our Societies Act. Parallel to that, government was seeking to find ways to, to manage the qualifications. So mediators would take the practicum, it would ensure that there was a, there was a um, there was a good and, um, and clear method for people to get mentored mediation experience rather than saying, I did a mediation um, you know, with my neighbors, I walked down the street or I went onto a school um, site and saw some children fighting and that was a mediation when I stepped in and helped them um, because there was a concern about what would it look like if you were demonstrating that you had experience in order to get onto a qualification. So, the government was looking at what would that look like and created a roster society. This happened the opposite way. It didn't start with a stakeholder collaboration. It started as a government initiative, but with huge outreach for stakeholder consultation. So reaching out to all of the same groups that were involved in the practicum society um, development, but also more broadly asking public input into what it should look like. 
um, to have a roster of qualified mediators, what would that look like? The primary objectives there were a little bit different because they were that public uh, protection of the public through what would look like um, a, something like a regulatory body. Um, it's never become a full regulatory body. There's no mandatory um, qualification in, in British Columbia to be a mediator. Anybody can hang out a shingle. It has always remained that way. But so that there was a group of mediators identified as, as having specific qualifications and that group of mediators are regulated. Um, and it was also really important to the government that this be seen as independent from government in order to maintain credibility so that they could refer to this roster without concerns that this roster was somehow controlled by government. Because government is, as, as I'm sure is the case in Kenya um, and other countries that might be represented here, um, government is very, very frequently a party to the mediation. And so was often seen as, as potentially in conflict of interest if they were also creating the mediator roster. Okay. Um, the court mediation program, which I mentioned was no doubt our very biggest program. And uh, as I said, it was, it was run by one of the two societies that became Mediate BC. It ran from 1998 to 2016. Um, you can see some pretty big numbers there in terms of how many mediations. Um, we had 744 mediators complete 10 mediations as a practicum, which is quite a lot. We also had you know, nearly 300 law students completing a practicum that ran through UBC Faculty of Law. Um, I happened to be a law professor at the time, and so I, um, I ran a class that was um, a practicum class for uh, law students. And so a significant number of students were able to participate in real mediations during that period. We also became more of a service organization too, because initially all mediations were practicum mediations. So it was all a mentor and a learning mediator co-mediating in a small claims matter. Um, but by 2000, it became apparent that we were impacting the backlog really significantly in the court. And the court was um, very interested in seeing expanded mediation, both for the backlog, but also because expanding the mediation was changing the nature of the ways people were coming to the court. The judges were identifying differences in what they saw when they went to settlement conferences. Um, we were settling about 60% of the cases in the room in a two hour mediation, but an additional 20, almost 25% were settling either on um, when they first received the notice of mediation or within two weeks after mediation. So um, presumed to be related to the mediation itself, that something had happened and people had gone away and been able to resolve it based on the mediation. So significant numbers of, of files were not going. And what the judges were saying was that the files that continued on and came before judges were much, much more ready to um, go into court because there were they had narrowed the issues. Parties often had far less that they were actually bringing to trial. Um, and so it was actually streamlining the trial process as well. So the court suggested that it would be um, helpful if we could have more mediators. And so what ended up happening was a group, a pool of at its highest 75 mediators um, were qualified to be provincial court civil mediators and uh, did mediations in the, in the small claims court. We scheduled them through Mediate BC. We placed them in, the, in um, different court settings and we um, supplied mediators for five or six registries at various times um, throughout the province. And as you can see there, um, 24,300 files referred over the, over the course of that period. So a lot of mediations took place. Um, the, the other thing that I think is probably worth mentioning is the mandatory voluntary um, component, because this is something that is always, it's, it's always a question when people enter into these kinds of processes. There's been a lot of research um, uh, particularly in the United States, because they started very early with some mandatory mediation programs. But um, throughout the world, more recently, people have, have looked at different forms of programs. Voluntary programs in almost any setting have simply not attracted any numbers. Um, it has been incredibly difficult. And 
sometimes you'll get a bit of a voluntary flow because there's an awareness of a program and people try it, but it rarely stays um, a, a positive flow in a, in a voluntary program. So in British Columbia, the choice was made to mandate. Um, and so not everything went to mandatory mediation during in this court process, um, but many, many files did. Um, and what ended up happening was getting some really good research data on which types of files were most readily settled in a mandatory mediation setting. Um, so what flowed from, the, uh, from this particular project was um, a mandatory model in British Columbia that now applies in the majority of our legislation, which is a notice to mediate. So we have created a model where um, Mediator mediation takes place um, when one party files a notice and, and the other party is required to participate in mediation. And Mediate BC was very much part of that and was the appointment body for those um, notice to mediate mediations for a really significant amount of time. So those are a few things that kind of came out of the court mediation program. And I'm more than happy to talk about um, that program when we get to questions. Um, I, I'll note that I was one of the program managers of that program for the first five years. Um, so can tell you a lot about design and a lot about the thinking that went into it if it becomes something that, that people are interested in. Um, the other really, really significant program is the Child Protection Mediation Program. And on this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Julie to talk a little bit about Child Protection Mediation. Thanks, Sharon. So Child Protection Mediation in British Columbia um, is under the, um, Ch the Child Family Community Service Act, which is the legislation um, body that operates, that social workers operate under. And in British Columbia, it's called the Director of Child Family and Community Service. And they, um, so they have a, let the legislation that says that they can resolve disputes um, by going to mediation um, or by going to court. And they actually say other like traditional decision-making processes, although that hasn't really um, happened too much in BC yet. So um, in, in 2006, one of the things, I'm not sure how many people were on the roster before then, but they recognized that they needed to have more people on the roster. And um, because in British Columbia, um, a significant amount of children that are in um, the government's care are Indigenous, and that they recognized that they needed to have Indigenous mediators operating in the communities and um, providing mediation services. So they partnered with um, Indigenous organizations, the Law Foundation, the Ministry of the Attorney General, and um, built a mediation practicum, which is how I entered the picture. Um, I was studying conflict resolution in my community already, and I was actually serving on the board of directors for um, a delegated agency, an Indigenous agency that provided um, services, health and uh, child welfare services to Indigenous communities and was trained as a negotiator and um, and and the, and the mediator and as a as a trainer and so then we um, we I say we and it was really Sharon and and her colleagues that that uh, that that uh, developed a, a practicum and partnered with different Indigenous organizations. And one of the ones that I was on the board of was, was one of them. And that's in the North Central, but also in the Lower Mainland and urban communities, and then in the interior. And they had their own processes for identifying appropriate people. Um, ours was actually very community driven, where communities actually nominated people who they thought would be, who already had the role, who already had a traditional or informal role in the community as peacemakers, as negotiators, as uh, um, as people who would help other people solve their problems, and um, and then they had to do um, some training, and then were um, were able to take the child protection mediation practicum, which was 
actually, I um, interestingly, like we did six child protection mediations and four of the small claims. And I was so resistant to the small claims model when I started um, and then was won over and came back and later did the six more um, to complete, complete the small claims court mediation because I found it incredibly helpful um, tool to, to learn many, many things from many teachers. So um, that was amazing. And so um, until from um, until just this April, uh, the Ministry of Attorney General administered the child protection mediation program. So hired the mediators um, at, at, through a through a difficult government bid process, and um, and and they were as Sharon had said, anybody in BC can be a mediator except a child protection med mediator. Then you do need to have specific qualifications, and you need to be admitted to a roster that was government run. Um, in, tw in April 2020, um, Mediate BC um, got was direct awarded the contract to administer the program. And currently about a thousand mediations happen annually in the province of British Columbia, all over the, all over the province. And um, we are looking to expand the amount of mediators and, and change how mediation is done a little bit in, um, especially in, in communities. Like we have such a diverse um, geography and, and population that to try to make it specific to each community that needs the services. What else? What did I leave out, Sharon? I mean, I think I think that's great. We can always answer more questions about the child protection mm -hmm. program. I, it, for me, it's um, it's interesting because we had a gap um, in between administering the um, court mediation program and the child protection mediation program. There was a period of time, and we can talk a little bit about that if it's of interest to anybody, where Mediate BC th went through a phase of being much more focused on its roster mandate uh, than it was on program administration. So it's it's as though we've kind of come full circle again and we're getting back much more into the program administration. But uh, there, was a, there was a bit of a window. Um, during that window though, and at various times, here's some, I, I, I already flipped to this slide accidentally pl clicking on other things on my computer, <laughs> but um, essentially, uh, sample programs through the years, I, we've been involved in a lot of different programs. Some of them are research programs. Some of them have been um, funded in order to um, find information about what can we do with um, child support eligibility in, uh, in the courts. Is that something that we can help with? So quite a number of these various programs have been funded over the years to um, answer a specific question and assist in um, either government or other funding bodies in expanding the use of collaborative decision making processes. But I, I'm listing a few here. I don't intend to talk about any of them in any detail, but I did want to illustrate the breadth of the kinds of programs that we've been able to be involved in. And I would say that in every instance, the reason we've been involved in them is fundamentally because we developed as a collaboration amongst so many different stakeholder groups and we have maintained um, stakeholder relations. Um, we have a judge from the provincial court sits on our board um, and participates in all decision-making. We have um, re continuing relationships with um, various organizations that do mediation training, that, that do any kind of um, legal aid, um, a variety of different things. And those are things that are really kind of fundamental to who we are is that we try to walk the talk. We try to demonstrate stakeholder collaboration in the development of all programs. And as a consequence, we have tended to be funded or supported um, when we reach out in collaboration with other groups to seek funding to, to do something that is of mutual benefit. So most of these are there. For those of you who, um, who heard Shannon Salter on Tuesday, um, she was telling a truly inspiring story of um, Civil Resolution Tribunal and uh, Mediate BC was part of that too. Um, initially, we provided a number of those mediators that she was talking about to the program um, and you know, on a part-time basis. Now they've expanded to the point where all of their um, people they're seeking to keep have full-time because they've just got so many staff doing that mediator role. Um, but there was a period when we were doing that as well as supporting in other ways in the development of that program. 
do you want to talk strategic focus, current strategic focus as our as as our board chair leading the strategic <laughs> development of this organization, Julie? <laughs> yes, actually. And that's um, so I started off as um, and, and I see Joy uh, Shigali has a question about child protection, and I think we'll, we'll get we'll get to it. Um, and I just want to talk about, so as you saw on the last slide that Mediate BC has been involved in a lot of things and the melding of the two organizations has caused in the last couple of years a bit of a shift. But I, I first became involved in um, with Mediate BC in 2006, I believe, when I started the practicum and then I completed it, became a mentor in the practicum, helped train other mediators and then began sitting on the board um, in 2017. And so just in the midst of, a, of huge shifts in the organization and, and, and then recently, um, so in 2019, we actually had a strategic planning session that helped us change our direction and looked at what, what, are, what is our goal of the organization. So um, it became clear that one of the things that really is, is um, important in British Columbia um, for a variety of reasons is access to justice. So people being able to access services um, for their legal issues. And that as uh, personally to me as somebody who lives in the North, which is often overlooked in terms of services and resources um, and as an indigenous person is, is super important. And, um, and, and, servicing the indigenous communities which are often the rural and remote remote communities in our in our in our province um, so really looking at like how do we help communities people in these communities these smaller communities have access to services that that meet their their um, social and and legal needs um, and, and as always, one of the things that became clear um, from, from the board and especially folks who came from, because we had essentially had two, two um, memberships, our board of directors and then roster committee members, and we melded them together, which was that the roster committee members felt protection of the public, um, ensuring that mediators are qualified and that there's standards of conduct and that there's a way to address any um, uh, misdeeds or, or mistakes that happen in the mediation program um, to come together. And then, of course, informing the public of British Columbia about, um, about mediation services. So that is where we are expending our energy. And, and actually, it's how Sharon came back on because she'd left, she'd left the organization for some point, some time. And we had this great need for somebody who would help um, who have, would help us search for other opportunities and who had a lot of experience in collaborating with other organizations. And so we invited Sharon to come back and work for us. And, um, and so we've been doing some um, things like quarantine. Um, so when COVID-19 hit and rather than looking at like a lot of mediations were canceled and people weren't working is that we found some ways to support um, online mediations, um, quarantine service, conflict resolution, now conflict coaching for teachers. And we're looking at um, issues of housing and oh yes, the pro bono uh, clinics. And one of the things that I'm most excited about is looking at um, more collaboration with Indigenous communities around providing uh, dispute resolution processes um, for Indigenous communities, not just in child protection, but in but in um, other areas and in the, in the need for commercial mediators. Um, so I'm just going to take a peek at the questions to yeah, see. Yeah, I'm, I'm pulling up the questions, Julie, and thinking mm -hmm. just just maybe maybe we respond to some questions now, just generally. Yeah. Because um, it looks like there's a fair bit of interest in understanding what our child protection mediation looks like, and that doesn't surprise me because I, I know that um, there there are some places where child protection mediation takes place, but it's not it's not a universal approach to child protection, um, and so what what it really is. It's mediations that will take place between the ministry, so the ministry representative, so typically the social worker, and parents or whoever is the guardian of a child who is in need of care. Um, and that means a bunch of different things. Need of care, need of care can be about, it can be about abuse, it can be about a ne neglect. 
Um, it's very often about a parent's inability to parent for some reason, um, for something that, that happens in their background or their history that has, has resulted in them being unable to provide adequate support for the, for the child. And they'll be reported. Very often what happens is, is a child is taken into care, so taken away from their parent. So I know that when, when we talk about those kinds of things, a, a huge concern that comes up often is, well, does that mean that what you're negotiating is returning a child to an unsafe situation? And that, that's not what child protection mediation is about. And I think it's really critical that we, we, we maybe mm -hmm. emphasize child protection mediation is about a plan of care to keep the child safe. So, but it includes the parents' engagement in that process because often the best thing for a child is to return to family, to find a way to do that, but to do it safely and to create parameters around that. So one of the rules around child protection mediation in BC is that you cannot negotiate about whether or not a child is in need of care. You start from an assumption that a child is in care, there are concerns. Um, it, you may, during the course of a mediation, determine that in fact there were mistakes made and uh, the child did, was not at risk, but that's not a point for mediation and it's not a topic. Social workers come in knowing that they do not have to justify that a child is in care. What they need to do is, is talk and give a parent an opportunity to identify the ways in which they might be able to ensure that the child is not at risk. Um, so it's a, it, it's a really multi-party um, discussion. Uh, lawyers are usually involved and it's, it's, a, it's a process by which um, in, when we started in 2001, there was, um, there was a, a new program, Surrey Court Project, um, and we started me measuring the um, impact of mediation at that time. And the first finding was that children were, were returning to their families six months earlier if they, there was a mediation than if there wasn't a mediation. It was speeding up the ways in which families were, were restructuring. It was speeding up access to resources that were supporting parents and families. So it has proven to be a really, really beneficial um, process. And um, at this point, both parents council and director's council um, equally uh, seek out the process in order to advance and speed up the opportunities for families to get support and be able to rebuild and bring children back to, to their families or to another appropriate supportive place. I don't know if you want to say anything else to that, Julie. Julie and I yeah. both do protection <laughs> mediation. <laughs> So, so one question was exactly what kind of disputes and so it is maybe who the child is living with so if they're living in stranger care with straight like foster parents, or whether they're living with extended family or other family, or say, if you know there's two parents, one is doing health is healthy and doing well and one maybe has an addiction or al alcohol problem, then which parent um, and plans of care for um, the child. So if the child has special needs or, um, or other things that need to be addressed and also services for the parents to um, alleviate the concerns that the social worker has about the family. And um, sometimes though, some of the things that are the most difficult um, like poverty and lack of housing cannot be addressed or resolved through child protection mediation. Um, one of the th things that drew me into it was the the issues that that bring people into um, child protection uh, issues is because of here the um, the Indian Act and policies of the government have caused Indigenous communities a lot of pain, and because of that, suffer a lot of socioeconomic difficulties. And in, and in conjunction with that, poor health and a lot of addiction. Um, issues and and poverty so having a broader view bringing the indigenous perspective of what family is um, can be addressed in child protection mediation whereas in court that wouldn't be possible because court is not um, designed to address or, or um, um, lo even look at those things so th so that is one of the reasons why um, you know when when the when the program was was added to was looking at pairing with indigenous communities. So people who have an understanding of, of um, what the community issues are and can, can, um, can understand that so that, you know, things aren't swept under the carpet or kids aren't returned to, to unsafe um, homes. Um, 
I think the other question is, is what are the minimum standards? And it depends on what kind of mediation, but child protection has kind of, I think the most stringent stand, um, or the, the, the most amount of requirements to practice as a child protection mediator. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, I, I flipped to this page primarily to say, um, on our website, um, we have admissions for the different rosters that we run. So we have a civil roster, we have a family roster, we have associate rosters for people who are learning, um, developing, so they've taken training um, and are trying to get enough experience to join the full rosters. We have the child protection roster and we also have a med arb roster for people who do um, the combined practice of mediation arbitration. Um, as, a, as a single practice. So we have a number of different rosters and each of them are very much, um, they're, they're similar. They all require um, experience. They all try or require specific, specific levels of training, um, but there are always some additional things. Um, family, for instance, you have to have family dynamics training, things like that. But I'd encourage you to have a look at the roster itself. Um, and as I say, you don't have to be on one of the rosters to conduct mediations in our province, except in specific circumstances like child protection. Uh, you can hang out a shingle and say you're a mediator and you might get hired by private parties. Um, so these are not universal, but it sets a standard by which um, most people will hire mediators from this roster because they know that at least they have those qualifications if they're looking for somebody. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question about um, the firm applied to the government to conduct the mediation and, and fee cost per mediation amount too. It, we, we've done a number of programs with government, so it probably depends on which program, but typically, um, typically most of the, the mediations that we've done in conjunction with government, um, what has been funded is the program. And uh, the and Mediate BC has set fees that they pay to mediators to conduct those. So in the in the court mediation program, that was the case, um, and we use it as part of our funding proposals to the government that we need to pay mediators this amount for those types of mediations. Similarly, the child protection program, there are set fees that are tied to the legal aid rate that lawyers are paid, actually, um, that mediators are paid hourly plus travel rates and things like that. So most of them are, they're, they're quite distinct for each program as to what the payment is, but generally Mediate BC is funded based on our submission that mediations will cost this much and we need to pay mediators whatever amount it is in that subject area. And I don't know if that answers it. So I'm gonna I, I'm gonna flip this off. I think we should probably um, allow. I, I, we have some more questions. We're happy to answer them. Well, Gary, did you want us though to take a break? Because um, I know that we were gonna hear from Angela for a little bit. We can always circle back and have conversation on any of these topics after. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sharon. Are you are you complete with your presentation, or we or you're suggesting we take uh, Angela and then you can carry on? Well, we were thinking that we could answer, we can continue to answer questions, or we can make sure that we give Angela an opportunity to, to speak now and we can circle back and answer questions more informally. We can both stay for longer too to engage in conversation. Because some, okay. some of the questions sound like there's interest in specific areas of what we do. And if okay. that's the case, we're happy to we're happy to do whatever works the best for this group, is really what I'm saying. Okay, okay, lovely. So um, um and Angela, we can we can have Angela speak to us. And then uh, we can then be able to have uh, the, uh, the questions uh, or, or comments uh, openly, then we can be able to share. And uh, the, the intention for this session, colleagues, is that uh, we, we it's a case study. And so uh, you notice like even on the chat I've, I've asked, so from the discussion that or the description that uh, Sharon uh, is giving, is that, does it mean working with the legal aid or the, the, the national legal aid, or does it mean now working with, with the um, let me say so, social services? So I think we can try and see, discuss, I mean, what this looks similar to based on what she's talked about. And then also even the nature of the way they form their, the, the society and how it runs. So kindly you'll allow us to invite um, Angela Munga Mwadumbo. Angela is the convener, the court annexed mediation bar bench committee of the Law Society of Kenya, uh, Nairobi branch. So Angela will be 
um, uh, uh, letting us know the, uh, the mandate of the committee and also its activities. So Angela, good evening to you. Um, thank you very much, Wangari. Good Thanks. evening, everyone um, here, here in Kenya. And good morning to our sisters uh, across the world. Um, let me first say that I'm very encouraged by um, what uh, our presenters have said, because they have you, you have showed us how or what mediation can become. I'm saying this because um, ADR or alternative dispute resolution has been around in our country for, for long, but uh, we have never had any structure, so to speak, around mediation. In fact, um, the decibels on ADR really, really got loud after the promulgation of our constitution in 2010, because it actually enshrined ADR as a dispute resolution process in the constitution. You see, previously it was very ambiguous. So people are doing mediation um, very informally. However, after 2010, when the new constitution came into force, the judiciary came up with a court annexed mediation as a way of um, exercising the mandate or furthering the alternative dispute resolution. This was in 2016 and it was um, commissioned as a pilot project only in the high court in Nairobi, that is our capital city. And even in the high court that has several divisions, it was piloted in only two divisions, that is the civil division and the family division. So the court annexed mediation ran as a pilot for around four years. It was actually rolled out in all the divisions of the high court and in all courts within the country this year, early this year, 2020. So in um, establishing the court annexed mediation, the judiciary had the following objectives. They wanted to enhance um, access to justice for all. They wanted to reduce the backlog and ensure speedy resolution of disputes, to reduce the cost of uh, resolving disputes, and to create an atmosphere of accommodation and intolerance. You see, the legal regime here in Kenya is the common law regime, which is very, very adversarial. In fact, before the civil procedure rules were amended in 2010, there was trial by ambush. Like you'd literally walk into court and not know what the other person would say or what the arguments for the other party were. So trial was very, very acrimonious. But um, first of all, the rules changed such that there was no trial by ambush, but still it's an adversarial system. So this uh, court annexed mediation was piloted so that um, we encourage um, some bit of tolerance and uh, to promote um, and to restore pre-dispute relationships. Because I mean, if you go through an adversarial system, chances are your relationship, I mean, because everyone wants to win, so people will do anything. Hence the need for, for mediation. So mediation was piloted in 2016, but with time, there was need to ensure a coordinated, efficient and consultative approach in achieving the core objectives. Because mediators are drawn from different um, professions. Then we have a mediation accreditation committee that is um, quote unquote, regulating and appointing the mediators. Then we have the judiciary that is overseeing this entire project. So you see people are doing so many things to enhance mediation, but there was no um, coordinated effort for people to, um, to um, there was no coordinated effort to, uh, to achieve the objectives. So the judiciary in conjunction with the Law Society of Kenya Nairobi branch established the court annexed mediation bar bench committee. Uh, let me be honest at this point, our committee is very young. It was um, established in 2020 this year, but we all know courtesy of uh, COVID-19 2020 really doesn't count um, because we had our first meeting in February then just as we are gathering momentum, as we are gathering steam, COVID-19 struck, 
So that was a, a blessing in disguise because uh, we sort of had to have a crash course on everything that we had intended to do because there was a bit there was an uptake in uh, matters that were referred to mediation because everybody wanted to resolve their disputes a bit faster because after COVID-19 struck and the courts were closed. So people now saw the need for mediation. So when the committee was established, um, the following are the members of the committee. We have um, uh, someone from the court annexed mediation tax force. We have the presiding judge for the divisions where the court annexed mediation is carried out. We have uh, Law Society of Kenya branch representatives. We have the deputy registrars of the, superior, of the superior courts. This is the high court. We also have uh, members of the court annexed mediation secretariat. We have court annexed mediators. We also have a, repre a representative from the mediation accreditation committee. So basically this is a committee that brings together all stakeholders so that we can keep the conversation going. We can know exactly where we need to channel our efforts. So what are our terms of reference? We have um, several um, issues that we seek to achieve. Number one, we want to implement policies and strategies of court annexed mediation and to identify challenges that impede the uptake of court annexed mediation and to propose um, effective solutions. And also to propose policy intervention, interventions to the court annexed mediation task force and to demystify issues affecting advocates, judges and magistrates in court annexed mediation and to develop a stakeholder engagement plan for advocates and other stakeholders to enhance information sharing and learning among stakeholders and to identify and propose training needs to the culture change committee for training advocates and other stakeholders. Um, that's, that's, that's a lot, but after the inauguration of the committee, we realized that we have three core functions and that's what we are trying to do. First, our first and most um, critical role that we seek to play is sensitization, because we are trying to promote mediation as, as a dispute resolution process. Coming from the history that um, litigation in Kenya is adversarial, we all need to retrain everyone, members of the public, advocates, even some judges and some magistrates or some judicial officers might not have been exposed to mediation. So they don't see it as, uh, they don't give it as much importance as it should. So our first core issue is uh, sensitization because we seek to create a culture change so that people embrace mediation more readily. We also seek to um, develop stakeholder engagements if you look at the legal regime in Kenya, there is no law that specifically governs mediation. Even court annexed mediation, in as much as um, it is set out under the umbrella of the judiciary, we don't have any laws in place. What we have are policies, practice directions. Um, currently, there are several bills that are pending in parliament. Um, trying to govern ADR and mediation. There are draft rules that are in the process of being validated. So we want our voice as mediators to be heard during this uh, legislative process so that um, the outcome of the laws will be something that will be of value to both mediators, to the judiciary and to the public. Um, I'm glad that um, from the presentation, we can see that this is something that was, is doable. You know, reading a report from other countries or from other jurisdictions where mediation has worked is not the same as actually hearing it from stakeholders. So we are very, I'm very, very encouraged um, because uh, it can work. Our generally, um, the intention is to have mandatory mediations, 
But given how young um, mediation is in the judiciary, we are still taking data because from the statistics there are, it, mediation works better in some divisions than in others. Like um, in the land, in the environmental and land court, the settlement rate is extremely low. But in the family division and in children matters, in some employment disputes and in civil disputes, the, rate, the settlement rate is a little bit higher. So I am very, very encouraged and very invigorated in, in this mandate that I have that it can work. And so um, that is all I have for you today. Um, I'd be, I'm happy to take any, any questions or comments. Over to you, um, Wangari. Okay. And yes. Sharon. Yeah, thank you so much, Angela. I think uh, uh, probably for a, a, a great percentage of the uh, mediator community, I would say what you're speaking about, uh, we probably may be thinking you are, you're the one in Vancouver uh, <laughs> as we are listening to you. <laughs> so I think yeah, oh, the, the, message, the message you're giving now, it seems to be a, a message uh, from Vancouver, uh, but I am here you're in Nairobi, so uh, yeah. But I think that's also why we have uh, these um, uh, opportunities to, to speak and learn about what is happening and where it's, um, it's, it's, it's all happening. Uh, so colleagues, in case you have uh, any, any questions, we can be, you can be able to uh, raise your hand and we can be able to take um, uh, the questions or any comments that you have. Um, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, uh, um, this is Joy Shigoli. I think such a working plan is provided for under the, the diversion policy. Where matters touching on children need to be in need of protection are diverted to friendlier options like mediation, counseling, rehabilitation, etc. I think that's a response to the inquiry um, that had put in asking whether uh, it means Kenyan mediators working with legal aid or social or social <laughs> services. Uh, Sharon, would you have uh, any comments uh, or any uh, any any? Any comments based on what uh, probably Angela has said? Is there any, any, any similarity? And then we will come to Kimutai who has raised his hand. Yes, please, Sharon. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, Angela, everything you're saying sounds remarkably much like uh, the, our experience. And I, I, don't want to, I don't want to add a depressing element. It continues to be some of our experience. We're continuing on that work in culture change for sure. But we've seen a very significant change over the years. It's, it's just that it's fascinating how, how resilient that adversarial mindset is in the courts. And um, it's, we're, we're spending a lot of time, I was a law professor for 14 years, trying to uh, change the way that we teach young lawyers um, so that we're not so focused and creating a mindset where everybody going into the legal system is automatically focused on competitive approaches. When Gary mentioned that um, I'm a game designer, um, I got into game design specifically to address the ways in which we socialize children to be competitive and to think that winning is the only possibility, an individual win is the only possibility. So my game design is actually around um, cooperation and finding ways to compete as a team so that uh, we can actually try and address some of that culture change because that adversarial component is really difficult. But the, um, the more that we have brought people in, the more that it has been a combination of people from different backgrounds rather than um, teams where people all went through law school training, um, the more that we have had a diversity of approaches, the more that culture has shifted. And we now see wonderful things where in our family law area, for instance, there's a really strong collaborative practice um, group where lawyers and um, counselors, um, child experts and financial experts work together to create a different way to negotiate than what would happen and always very holistic, always trying to bring in all of the professionals who might support a family rather than simply go to court and start arguing. We're seeing those kinds of impacts. So I, I would say, I mean, yeah, I, I hear so much resonance and I don't wanna say it in a way that is, is you know, 
not adding hope. We have seen change, we do see it. And we have areas where the change has been truly, truly significant. And uh, at this stage, most lawyers um, in most of our civil and commercial areas of practice do see mediation as a tool that is a critical part of what they do. And they don't need to be mandated to court. It will be, they will um, initiate the mediation process now. So huge positive. And uh, I, I think it's fantastic to hear about the work you're doing. I, I, it's, it's really inspiring to hear um, you're starting with so much stakeholder collaboration already. So I know we had some questions. I'm happy to take some. Uh, we will have Kimutai uh, Cherono and then uh, followed by Bernard Rotich. We can take the two and then we, uh, they can be responded to. Kimutai, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, had, I had mentioned something about the bidding and the mediation. And I think when you, uh, during your talk, uh, Sharon, you mentioned that there was a situation where the government put out a bid for mediation firms to come. So my mind automatically started thinking, well, does that mean that the, the lowest bidder gets the business and does it, you know, push down the cost of mediation? So that was my, that was the, 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 the point I was trying to get at. Um, the other questions I have, with your wide experience in interacting with the public, what is the most effective way of promoting mediation to the public? Because we have a situation here where as you said, people say, let's go to court or uh, stuck in the adversarial mindset. So I'd be interested in hearing what do you think was the most effective way of promoting mediation? And then um, Julie, uh, now I don't know how to put this because we have, a, we, have a, we have a situation where mediation, we believe came out originally in our culture. It's just that it's kind of re being revived as the natural way of solving disputes. And I was wondering whether we're, as a, you call native Canadian? I'm not sure what the, 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 the most uh, appropriate term for it is, but as a native Can Canadian, have you found that your cultural uh, approach to mediation allows you to settle issues in a way that is more culturally sensitive than actually the judicial system based on common law like we have also had imposed on us. <laughs> All right, thank you. So um, I, I, I'll quickly answer the bids question because it is not something that comes up a lot in terms of the way our government reaches out for mediation services, but it is something that in the last, um, in the last year, in fact, there've been several bid processes and, and that's new, that's um, relatively unusual. Um, and it is tied to just government change. Because one of the issues, of course, that we've been dealing with throughout the years, and one of the reasons why we had a period where we weren't running programs um, is because of change in government. When you elect a new government, they may take different approaches and the minister, the minister changes, the approaches change, the um, focus on mediation changes. And that's something that we've been dealing with. So yes, this past year, there've been a couple different bids and there, and each government body we have seen um, takes a different approach to how they view um, the financial aspect of it. There's absolutely something attributed to how much what you what you bid at as an organization to run things, and it there's no question that that will have an impact in government decision making. Um, we've been like, but we're, we're, what we found, like, for instance, we had to bid on the child protection program, we got a direct award, I think Julie mentioned that initially when it moved from the Ministry of Attorney General, but it then went up for um, bid in the fall. But what we could see from the way that that was drafted was that the government body responsible for children and families was deeply concerned about um, indigene indigeneity and um, the the appropriate um, processes and use with Indigenous children that was built into the, the bid itself. Um, there were questions around experience in particular areas that that would have made it impossible to simply win the bid by just bidding the lowest you possibly could. You had to be able to demonstrate that you had these culturally appropriate approaches, that you had some ability to engage in those ways. So I, I feel confident that in general, the government is um, 
is still seeking to uh, set other kind of qualifications. I just hope that we don't actually see it continue down this path in a particularly um, big way, because I do think there is a, I think what you raise is a danger. And I think it's a possibility um, when government puts things out to bid that you absolutely can have somebody who doesn't have the skill set, doesn't, doesn't care about public protection, can take on any, any kind of role this way. Um, when you ask about the, the promotion to the public, we are, we are really still playing with that a lot. We've done a huge number of different things in public education. Um, and for quite a number of years now, we've received a really substantial um, amount of money from the Law Foundation of BC, specifically targeted at public legal education. Um, we, we were, we get, you know, we, we've done a lot of um, in-person presentations. You know, here's what mediation is. We've done that by reaching out to different communities um, who might have particular interest in it. We've done it through um, developing relationships with what we call trusted intermediaries. So somebody who are social service organizations, um, nonprofit societies that work with communities that we anticipate will be in need of conflict resolution services and ensuring that our information is front and center on their website so people can seek us. Um, doing presentations to people who might make referrals like um, right now we're working on a housing project so I'm doing I'm having relationship building with um, BC nonprofit housing um, association and talking to individual service providers who are working in housing projects each of those individual ones works really incredibly well for initial um, initial referrals but what does happen is a fade um, every time people turn over in those kinds of organizations, you have to revisit and you have to start again. So what, uh, what we are finding is actually um, picking up and this is, I'm, I'm, I'm talking future goals right now because this is, this is where I'm focusing my, fo my attention right now. Um, I'm finding that being able to find ways to reach reach the community at more of a, I, this will sound funny, but more at a popular culture level. Um, our media talks only about the adversarial things. Our media reports on things that are not, that are, that are disasters. It doesn't report on the ways in which we resolve things. Um, our TV shows are rife with adversarial lawyer shows and things like that. So we're trying to find ways that we can bring collaborative um, processes more into the public view in those kind of ways so that mediation is something that comes to mind. So we're doing things like, we're doing a wine tasting this week um, where we're talking about the kinds of things that, you know, when, when wineries and breweries collaborate to create different things. So, but it's putting our name on things that are much more public. Um, I, on a personal note, I am actually writing a TV series with my daughter right now that is about a mediator. And so starting January, we're going to try and sell a TV series about a mediator that actually, in order to get it out there, um, to, get, to get an image of a mediator that is positive and that resonates with, with people, because that is something that, that is lacking, um, that public perception. Julie does something, and I'd invite anybody here actually to join us on that. I should put that out there. Um, we've got Julie doing um, conversations with Julie is what we call it, but she does an Instagram live show once a week and uh, chats with somebody who has some connection to conflict resolution or some interest in something related to it. And she's just doing it as a chat. And we're going to package that more as a podcast so that it's about personalizing and humanizing. And every time we do those things, it seems to stick. People remember us, they remember the name, and they remember the notion. And so it comes up when they're thinking about conflict, when they're in conflict, because you just don't catch people at the right time otherwise. And get hit, definitely, definitely work with the lawyers, because they will control at least some of the, the disputes and them thinking mediation is, is probably a really big lead for everybody else. Julia, I'll pass it over to you. I know you had a question to answer. 
Yeah, th thanks. And I, I've, I've been really appreciating the um, Sharon's approach around um, personalizing mediation and having that view before people even get into conflict. Because my, one of my mentors told me that people don't hire mediators out of phone books, which, you know, I mean, never happens now because there's no such thing as phone books. But you need to know somebody and you need to have known somebody who's had a positive experience with it in order to, for people to say, try this, it works. Um, and I really appreciate your question about Indigenous approaches. Um, I'm a member of the Wet'suwet'en Nation, and we had a, a traditional process of we are governed by clans and we have chiefs of our clans. And so they actually um, traditionally had a role as like mediator arbitrators. And so um, it, they were in charge of the clan and if there was a dispute or when there was a dispute, they would try to mediate it. And if there was no solution available for mediation, they would make a decision about how, how what should happen in the family or in the clan. And, and so that's one of the ways I got drawn into it was because I saw that there was an overlap between child protection mediation, which is interest-based and our own traditional processes. And that um, by entering into communities, and even if they're not, um, because BC is incredibly diverse with the amount of Indigenous communities. So even if they're not identical, so somewhere into the northwest of me is Niska um, communities, and there's a cluster of communities there. And their culture is similar, but not identical. But as long as I can ask the right questions about like, who needs to be in the room? Because our, our idea of family is different than the traditional sort of nuclear um, Euro-Canadian idea of the nuclear family of mother and father and children. We have our sisters um, are responsible for our children as well. And um, they're the disciplinarians. And, and, and so our, our definition of family is more inclusive. And so when I go to do a mediation, um, asking the right questions about who should be in the room and who are the decision makers that should participate in processes are really important to achieving success in having a, a process um, where people feel um, that they have a real voice in it. And the other part of it is, is that knowing, uh, being able to identify your mediator is somebody who shares a lot of the things around um, the impacts of colonization is that you don't have to feel like you have have to defend yourself or that you're othered in that process um, and that they understand your life and your lived experiences and here uh, reserve life or reservation life is very different than urban life and and so somebody who identifies and I mean and part of that is even with non-indigenous communities is that because I live in the north sometimes there's some communities where they don't want anyone who comes from the city to come mediate because they feel like this rural identity and the country life is different than city life in 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 parts of the country so it, it's um it can be really important and that's part of why we are trying to even get more indigenous people on the roster and especially as we're negotiating some things. I know that Angela, you mentioned that land disputes are the ones that never get resolved. And, and that's the thing that is the sticking point for us. I mean, if you've been watching can Canadian news at any time in the last year was the big things that almost came to um, our cl closest to armed conflict is the Mohawk and the Wet'suwet'en disputing um, a land use here. And, and, and so people get really heavily involved in that. And, and that's part of what we're helping, hoping to expand into is, is having people trained in culture um, to help right. resolve some of those disputes. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we had uh, Bernard Rotich. Bernard Rotich. Bernard. Okay, as uh, Bernard gets on, Angela, you Angela, you wanted to speak, Angela Munga. Um. Yes. Uh. Wangari, I have seen your comment on the chat about uh, lawyers, judges, and magistrates of court annex mediation. Technically, we don't have any 
lawyers, magistrates, or judges of court annexed mediation because um, court annexed mediation just comprises of the mediation registry and the mediation um, accredit, no, the court annexed mediation secretariat and the mediation accreditation committee. However, how the lawyers, magistrates, and judges come in is that um, once a dispute is filed in court, yes, it please. is the judges or Good the evening. magistrates. Ooh. Hello? So, uh, uh, is, that, uh, uh, is that Bernard? Can we, can we hold on for Angela to finish and then we will come to you, Bernard? So, Angela, you may proceed. So, um, as I was saying, magistrates and judges are the ones who refer disputes from court to court who refer disputes to court annexed mediation. So the reason why they need to, they, there's need to sensitize the judges and the magistrates is that um, initially when, when um, the court annexed mediation was rolled out, matters would just be referred to mediation without first letting the parties know that their matter has been referred to mediation. They would not go to court first. Parties would just receive a notice that uh, your matter has been referred to mediation uh, report before this mediator or file your case summary before the mediator. So statistics showed that there was very low uptake of mediation. So there, there a decision, a policy decision was made that before a matter is referred to mediation, it's first mentioned before the magistrate or the judge who will try and explain to the parties that court annexed mediation is also a judicial process that it is sanctioned by the judiciary. So that is why we need, that, we need to sensitize the magistrates and the judges that when parties come before them at the point of referring the matter to mediation, parties understand that this is a legal process and that the mediator is actually there to help them and that if they get into a settlement, then it will be it will be like a court order. So once uh, once that was started, there was um, there was an improvement in the matters that could be in the matters that uh, I mean the settlement rate increased. Where do the lawyers come in? Most of the, um, given the background that this is an adversarial process, most lawyers when they come to court they are ready for war, quote unquote. So if they are just told, okay, now go and agree. You see, some lawyers see it as already losing the fight. And uh, the lawyer is the, con is the agent of the client before the court. So if the lawyer does not necessarily understand the process or the advantages of mediation, then the lawyers become an impediment to the process. So that is why even the lawyers need to be sensitized on what exactly court annexed mediation entails. And then, of course, we also need to sensitize the public so that they are aware that when you file a case in court, there is a possibility that can be that it can be referred to mediation. I'm uh, very happy with what uh, Sharon has said because it's actually true. There's there's no movie or or series that comes to mind where where the the starring or the leading role. Um, entered into negotiations or there was some sort of mediation. It is always winner takes all, There's, you either win or you win. So this is why we really need to get that conversation out there. So that is how all these parties come in to mediation, especially court annexed mediation. Thank you, Angari. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that clarification. Banach, Rotich, are you able to speak now? Yes, thank you, Wangari, and good evening. Good evening, thank you, yes. Okay, I want to thank the presenters, that is Julie and uh, Sharon, together with Angela for that uh, uh, presentation, it was good. I wanted to, uh, to make an observation that this is specifically to Angela, who is now the chair of that task force to ensure that uh, mediation in Kenya picks and picks in the right footing. As uh, Sharon was presenting, uh, I learned that uh, they, are, they have established, because it has been there for quite some time, 
that it is good that we are having these uh, conversations so that we can be able to learn from those countries which they have already had their mediation well established. There's something which is key, as Sharon was presenting, that their government had a mandatory uh, mentorship program where the young mediators could uh, be helped to up their skills. Because uh, just like driving, you can never learn to drive unless you are on the, behind the, the wheel. So I was hoping that uh, now that engine and mediators grow in the mediation uh, provision so that we can have this and have it right even from the onset. Thank you. Over to you, Wangari. So Angela, yes. you, you, yes. cannot learn, you cannot learn unless you're on the wheel. So can you please uh, uh, help us understand how this uh, bar bench eh? yeah. <laughs> so will we'll, we'll enable mediators to be able to get onto the wheel? Thank, um, you. And thank you very much, Bernard, for that inquiry, because it's, yeah, it's very, very relevant at this, yeah, in advancing uh, the quality of the mediators. Thank you, Bernard. Mm. Well, um, first of all, the bar bench committee is more of a liaison committee between all the stakeholders. That's number one. Number two, um, currently within the court annexed uh, mediation, we don't have a mentorship or a mentoring program as yet, because the assumption is that for you to apply to be a court annexed mediator, you are already qualified as a mediator. But uh, thank you for that, uh, for that uh, question and that insight. That is definitely something that we, we need. We, arrangements can be made and maybe we can put policies in place so that we can uh, start mentoring um, upcoming mediators. But for now, um, that program, we are not doing that for now, given how young this committee is having been um, established just this year, but uh, that's, that's food for thought. That's food for thought, Bernard. Back to you, um, Wangari. Okay, thank you. Um, Sharon or Julie, any uh, contributions on that, uh, what has been discussed so far? Can I comment a little there? Yes, please. Or not, Angela has said, yeah. There was a bit of a ch challenge at some point when it that, came that to. Finished? Yeah, yes. one way. Yes, please. I say there was a bit of a challenge at some point when it came to mentor mentorship, particularly under that um, under Mark, the accreditation uh, committee, and the issue was uh, the element of confidentiality sometimes, and sometimes the clients' cases cases getting compromised, and I think that is where. Uh, much as there's the, the element of mentorship, the fact that this matter is in court and they feel like maybe it might be a bit compromised because again, you see when you get into mediation, there's the element of confidentiality. And that is one thing that has made them slow down a bit. They are not very keen on that aspect. Yes, just briefly that. Okay, yeah, thank you for that comment. And I, I, I bring back to you uh, uh, one way. So how does uh, that the trainee advocates and how does it work? Because I, I it, it definitely must also include uh, confidentiality, and mm -hmm. that's that that is I would take that to or take that that's a time for mentorship and yeah such, yeah. The, 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 when it comes to the trainee advocates, you see the trainee advocate their specific trainings we have all gone through, very specific and there's particular parameters of, um, of the legal framework. And the element of, of, of confidentiality is critically there and you are bound by it being an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Now, the problem is now with mediators. You see, you're bound by what? And how is, how is the government uh, protected? It? How, how are the clients protected? What, what, where will you go to in case of anything? The law society is very, very clear on how it disciplines its lawyers. Who is going to discipline the mediators when there's any default? 
or when there's any deviation from um, from what is supposed to be done. I'm I'm pretty happy to just talk to, to how a bit we of a... did it. <laughs> Sorry, if, if it's helpful, I'm happy to talk to how we dealt with that. Um, yes, because please. Obviously, that that was a concern. Um, and, and there's and depending on the type of mediation who's involved, whether it's court annexed, whether it's done in some other area, there's different ways that it's dealt with. Um, but we um, required every person who was a learning mediator coming into our practicum program to enter into a contract with us that included a um, standard that they would follow the um, the standards of conduct that were set for all mediators. We do have um, a disciplinary program and a complaints program associated with Mediate BC, um, but uh, a learning mediator would sign that as well. We also would then enter into the agreement to mediate that was signed by all parties at the beginning of a mediation was also a contract that the learning mediator and the lead mediator would also be signing on, which would include additional information about confidentiality. As the program evolved in the court, um, by early 2000s, I think 2001, the, um, the, uh, the confidentiality piece was actually, we worked with the government to write it into the rules of court. Um, but for the first three years, it was managed through the agreement to mediate and through the agreement that was created with the mediator uh, uh, requiring them to sign on to the standards of conduct that require, so two different levels of confidentiality and a recourse to, um, to our committees for discipline. Um, it was, uh, if they belong to another professional society, then the way our standards of conduct are written are that the rules of the other societies um, take precedence. So if they're a lawyer who is pretending as a mediator, they're bound by all of the requirements that they would have under the law society. Similarly, if they're a counselor, similarly, if they come from a social work background, all of those have incredibly um, stringent um, requirements around confidentiality as well. So they're simply reinforced by our standards of conduct. But even for mediators who aren't coming from a professional background, they were required to follow that. And that applies through um, our child protection program. It applies through the family. It applies through all of them. So we, we have arranged systems to ensure confidentiality and that there's a recourse. Can I just add that, and I appreciate um, Angela that it's new work, but if you're gonna take any lesson from uh, mediation in British Columbia is don't wait to try to bring young mediators into the profession because we are really grappling with um, a population of mediators that are really aging. And a lot of us are reaching retirement age and we don't have practicums or, or things now to support new mediators entering the profession. That's a good point. I, I was also going to chime in and just so it, Angela just uh, another thing you said that really resonated for me was the 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 need for lawyers to understand about mediation and the critical importance of that. Um, when you were speaking, it reminded me of an early study we did in the in the court mediation program um, where we were looking at settlement rates and also our um, we were surveying every party in the mediation, um, every single per participant as to how satisfied they were with the process. That was around fairness. It, we, we checked outcome too, but the fairness and procedural fairness perceptions. And it was fascinating. Our settlement rate dropped 10% every time you added a lawyer to the room. So if, if parties weren't represented, settlement rates would be say 65%. It would be 55% if there was one lawyer, it would be 45% if there were lawyers for both parties. And similarly, satisfaction rates with the mediator plummeted every time a lawyer was in the room. Um, and it was quite fascinating because we spent quite a lot of time kind of going back and forth, talking to mediators, talking to lawyers, talking to parties and surveying them to get a good sense of this, to not just jump to the conclusion that um, some lawyers pushed us to conclude that that means those, those were bad settlements, all those other settlements, like, you know, had to be because, you know, when the lawyer was there, they were protecting their clients. So otherwise, they're being forced into bad settlements. But we also saw a pattern of complaints about lawyers. And as the program manager, I used to take the phone calls from the mediation room itself. And I had repeated calls from parties who'd stepped outside for a caucus and were phoning to ask how to fire their lawyer so they could reach a settlement that actually met their interests. 
while their lawyer was trying to block them. So we had a lot of a lot of interesting and fascinating data that demonstrated that until lawyers understood the value of mediation came prepared and seeking to utilize mediation as a tool to support their clients to reach a settlement that would, would help them, lawyers were actually blocking settlement in those, in those matters. Yeah. Um, Sharon, it's interesting because that's actually where we are right mm -hmm. now. We are trying to <laughs> get the culture change. And speaking as a lawyer, I know, um, you know, when you go to speak to other lawyers, they have, they have genuine concerns because they're thinking if these people, if everybody gets used to agreeing, we are going to be out of business. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just telling them that there still will be business because I'm quite sure 20, um, 22 years into the project, I know there are still lawyers in British Columbia. Then, there's um, more the lawyers, there's more lawyers, yeah. and there's more yeah. work because yes, more people yes. will actually return and you get repeat business yes. if what you've done is actually assist people to solve their problems in a way that is um, relationship building, that creates mm. the kind of ongoing benefits that we hope for in mediation. Lawyers who are involved as problem solving lawyers rather than adversarial lawyers have a flood of extra business and referrals to them. And we have seen the growth of, of legal practice with almost everybody who becomes skilled as a mediation advocate and a settlement counsel. So, yeah, that's, so. that's, that's actually <laughs> true. Now, let me just chime in on the issue of um, confidentiality. Um, we are alive to the fact that um, here in Kenya, there is no centralized um, legal regime that governs mediation as of now. In fact, court annexed mediation is currently being governed by the, I mean, mediators are bound by the code of conduct and by practice directions. This was gazetted by the by the chief justice. I mean, as lawyers, we all know that uh, you really can't sue someone on the basis of uh, practice directions, maybe you reprimand them. So what is happening currently is that um, there are several bills that are pending that will, um, that will seek to standardize the training and regulation of mediators. So we are very alive to that fact. Um, and that is, that is work in progress. In fact, uh, the mediation bill, no, mediation rules are currently at the validation stage. The way the, the rulemaking process is, there are some rules that can be promulgated by, government, by parliament and others can be through the rules committee. The mediation rules have already passed through the rules committee and I can assure you that there are several clauses pertaining to pertaining to confidentiality and there's also the issue of uh, bringing in trainee um, mediators. So that is something that we are really working towards. Then one, um, I, even as we are looking for ways in which we can, we can bring in the mentors and still have it, have it uh, legal, so to speak. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you for those contributions. And I, I must say, uh, I'm grappling with the context that uh, we are now uh, starting to raise that there's an issue about confidentiality with mediators. When uh, in the training, I think that is normally such a, I mean, it's really just a very, I mean, emphasized very much. And also connecting this with the fact that um, Sharon has actually indicated that Mediate BC as a society itself, and it's probably one just what it's just what it's one of the societies among many many others has set um its own code uh, let me say uh standards it has set its own uh, ways of operation for the mediators and the mediators respect that work along that it has its own disciplinary um system so i think uh, it is something that is possible that there can there, there can be societies even in kenya and they can be as many as probably as many as they would wish to be that are for mediators or for people in this work. That is the, just my thinking. And they can have their standards. Um, uh, for me, it's another very long argument with whether we need the, the, the bill and especially as it is right. But I think that's what the discussion um, for, for, for right now. But it, I think it's especially just that context where Sharon has pointed out that as their own society, they have set standards which their members follow and if you don't follow, then there is a way that um, the society now takes care 
of that. Yeah, I think that's one of the things. Okay, great. Um, yeah, this is a very, very uh, enlightening conversation. And uh, I'd like to invite um, a number of uh, the colleagues and what we are asking them is to just tell us um, uh, one specific thing that for them is a take, it would be a take, out, a take out from this conversation. And um, as I said, that the African International Mediation Week, um, it is, um, we, uh, we actually end today because tomorrow we get into the strategy conference. Uh, on Friday and strategy conference is about uh, developing the action plan. So each of the sessions we host, so we are, we are hosting, um, are, are aimed at enlightening mediators in something or helping us to combine several things. And we hope that you can actually have a take, um, a take away. So I'll invite several mediators who will uh, just share with us what they have got. As, uh, they may uh, uh, ask a, a question, but just what is the one thing that they, they for them they will be taking out from here. So uh, we have a young mediator, Rashid, who's on the call, Rashid Mwiza. Uh, we have uh, Joy Shigoli, who's uh, uh, one of the conveners of uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, um, African International Mediation Week. She's part of the Coast Mediation and uh, Legal Consultants who are uh, co-convening this uh, collaborating. Uh, we'll also invite Christina Gatura, who is a mediation trainer, uh, Kimutai Cherono, who is um, the founder of Complete Consultants, uh, that is a mediation firm. And we'll also invite uh, Morenike, who is uh, from ODR Africa, based in Nigeria. So Rashid, kindly, and then Joy, Christina, and uh, mediator Kimutai, then we can have uh, Morenika. Kindly, uh, yes, what is that one thing that for you is a takeaway from here? Rashid, Wiza? Okay, uh, Joy Shigoli. Joy Shigoli, you may go. Uh, hi, Wangare. Very well, thank you. Hi. Hey, thank uh -huh. you so much. Uhali Gani. Let's stand there. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Good morning, Sharon and Julie. Uh, good evening, Angela, and uh, the participants on this webinar. I am uh, encouraged on what Mediation BC so Society has done. While we are busy complaining and uh, grappling with the, uh, only the, the lack of uh, funding in the country, but also the legal regulatory framework, that is, they seem to have taken the come up with rules that people are able to depend on and, and uh, work around. And they are with the small claims courts. And the other thing is, let us work, work with what we have. With or with no Uh, the framework at the moment. Let us keep uh, promoting mediation awareness such that by the time we have our mediation bill in place, by the time our that we will be prepared to take the bus, a bowl of mediators, getting the professional colleagues after taking their mediation certificate that they don't seem to be making as much money as they should, time will come. Many of us are frustrated that when you when you appear in a matter with the lawyers present, they seem to be talking down on you and frustrating us. But as I keep telling my fellow lawyers, you cannot stop an idea whose time has come. Mediation is a new kid on the block. You cannot ignore its good qualities. It, the time has come. I am more impressed by the Mediation BC Society that they are handling uh, children matters under their program, um, Child Protection Mediation, which I think Mediation is bound to benefit children issues a lot, especially in Kenya, where you find half of the children that are put in courts are children that are not necessarily criminals, but children that are in need of protection. So when introduced softer skills, 
skills like um, uh, mediation and maybe counseling, which we, which I am aware has been provided for under the diversion policy under the ODPP's office, uh, which is uh, um, uh, being a champion right now. So yes, there is hope in mediation. Do not lose hope. Working on yourself, keep partnerships, uh, and uh, in as far as mentorship is concerned, you can be your own mentor. Go to the websites, do your Google de searches, attend as many seminars as you can, and get out. For so you, uh, interesting to necessary mentorship. My institution is one of them. I work for the Coast Mediation Center, which creates awareness uh, on mediation and is also a conflict management center. Uh, we may not have the mass to take up mentorship, but we try a mediator. So look out for opportunities and institutions that are providing for that. Okay. Thank you very much, Joy. Uh, a couple of things that have come from Joy Shigoli. Uh, Joy Shigoli uh, was part of uh, the team that uh, from Coasts Mediation and Legal Consultants, and they hosted a seminar, an international seminar on the blue economy uh, and um, uh, mediation uh, in the blue economy. So a couple of things I've heard from you is that uh, there are opportunities, just the same way Mediate BC indicates um, how they started off, there are opportunities, and it's about Keeping, keeping the momentum. And then also the aspect that mediation can be very useful where children are concerned. Uh, and at the same time is uh, something you said, be your own mentor. There are great uh, avenues that you can be able to use uh, for, to, to, to be able to develop yourselves. Um, thank you for that, uh, Joy Shigoli. Mediator Christina Kinyo, we may kindly have your comments. Christina, you may unmute kindly. Uh, yes, Wangari, thank you very much. How thank are you, you for... today? I'm well, I'm well. It's good to see you. Yes, welcome, kindly proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the, those who have contributed, uh, the speakers. I think this is a very important discussion to the practitioners um, like us. And uh, it's also giving um, an exposure and, of course, food for thought to, to, to us mediators. And uh, listening to all the discussion uh, that has been going on and the conversation, uh, it, it leads me to, to a, a thought that um, there is a lot really which has to be done and that uh, someone has to go ahead and do it. That uh, we don't just wait for, you know, things to be done for us, but someone has to, to you know, someone has to get up and do something. Uh, of course, that is as mediators. And also listening to Sharon and her colleague, uh, we, we, we still have a long way to go, but uh, at least we are making the baby steps. Uh, so to speak. So uh, I think for us, it's, uh, it's something that we need to reveal. And uh, from uh, the background of a trainer, uh, I, I also think we also need to review a little bit of our training and uh, probably increase something and uh, some of the information that we are getting here, uh, especially in the area of practice. And, um, and uh, of course, um, uh, refining the mediators, so to speak, adding something more than what we are offering currently. Therefore, uh, as um, as um, the uh, what's her name? Sorry, Munga. As Munga said, uh, that there is a lot of going on behind the scenes within the judiciary on the reforms and the changes and modifications of the. Media, in the, the media of the mediation policy and the uh, uh, code of ethics and everything around mediation, uh, then uh, for me, that's a good thing to hear 
because we, we are looking forward to um, a career that is really supported uh, by the government, that has government support, that has a, uh, uh, also support or acceptance from the people. And uh, it, as mediators, we really are going to make this happen uh, by also showing that uh, we are actually up to it and we are able to. And this will be based on the skills that we are getting from our trainings and also from the upgrading, the CPDs that we are doing. So uh, uh, if, I were to, if I were to continue contributing, I'll be so much on the training aspect uh, because what I'm hearing more in the conversation is about the practice uh, perspective, but I'm more on the training aspect because what are we producing to go to do the practice? That's my question. And I think again, as trainers, we need to get back to the drawing board and see what we can add and share it with the judiciary. Uh, thank you very much, Wangari. Back to you. Back to you, Wangari. Yes, uh, thank you, Christina. So from you, I've had uh, the aspect of uh, added skills, the issues of the, uh, the area of uh, development of a career that uh, has acceptance by the people and government. And I believe there are various avenues that can be looked at to get to that. Okay, uh, Rashid, are you back? Uh, let's have Morenike. Morenike, Morenike, Karibu. <laughs> I, Karibu, Karibu Wangari. <laughs> I'm learning fast. <laughs> yes, you are. So welcome. Uh, so yeah, Morenike is, uh, is, is the founder of ODR Africa. Um, she'll actually be speaking with us. She'll be with us tomorrow as we are looking at development of uh, 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 mediation tools and um, ODR tools that we can be able to uh, pass protocols for uh, mediation centers. So Morenike, what is your takeout today? Well, um, thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Julia, and thank you, Angela. I think this was a very enlightening session. And I just want to lend my voice to what has been said, what Sharon and Julie. We started the multi-door courthouse almost 20 years ago. Nigeria actually, Lagos has the very first court-connected ADR center in Africa. And I actually not only um, mediate at that center, I also teach, I also train mediators at that center. So we've gone through all of the things that I hear Angela say that they are going through. And of course, we've had the experience Sharon has shared too with the lawyers. And what we've been able to do in the last couple, uh, over a decade now, because I have started mediation since about 2005, is educating the lawyers. And we actually have a training a training route for mediation advocates, not only lawyers, even non-lawyers actually train as mediation advocates. And when I say mediation advocate, what it just means is that there are people who come into the process and lawyers have actually learned that that's another stream of income for them now because they come to support the, profit, uh, the process because they understand the benefits to their clients being supportive and collaborating during the process. So it's not, it's mediation, we've got, we've been able to move past mediation seen as the junior sister of arbitration. We've actually seen that mediation is used for, by more commercially minded and reasonable people. People who want to stay in business and move forward. People who don't just want to sit in courts. People who understand the need and the time value of money. So we've, for me, I think what I've been able to get out of this session is that we all, whether we are black, indigenous, white, we all pass through that stage when mediation is just coming up. And we've passed through that stage. I can, I can assure you, for you in Kenya, you will go past it in no time. All you need to do is to engage with the law society, ensure that you are able to do a lot of advocacy with the law society. And there is nothing wrong, just as Wangari had said, with having a lot of um, ADR centers or private practitioners, because we are in Nigeria now, we're at that stage where we are now encouraging private mediation. Because with the post, with the COVID issue, we saw that the courts were shut for so long and so many people were just helpless because the ADR center is also court connected. It was cut off in a bit with the closures and the protocol 
But if we actually had a private radiation practice built up, and that's what we're trying to do, because we've all seen the benefit and the, the beauty of having mediated agreements as opposed to all banging our heads and cough. So for me, I think this has been a very good session. And I just want to encourage you. In Kenya, we've been there. In Nigeria, we're moving on. And just the same thing Sharon has explained that has been happening is what has been happening with the lawyers. And of course, with the issue of uh, regulating the practice, the multi doctors have just like Mediate PC. We have our code of ethics. We have the disciplinary process and procedure. And so you, you just don't keep erring uh, mediators in the floor. And then we also have continuing legal education, uh, sorry, continuing mediation, mediator education for the mediators, just to be sure that they keep up and they're able to deliver what we want them to deliver. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for adding in a, a, another voice that tells us about what is happening in or uh, what has happened in uh, um, another part of Africa. And I think it's also, it's quite encouraging. And I think what you're trying to tell Angela is that uh, sh uh, she can take the next flight and uh, you, you'll be at the airport for her tomorrow so that you can have the, the true exchange program. Eh? So Angela, I think that was an invitation to you. And, but yes, there's great opportunity to learn and we've uh, also uh, shared a, a great deal in this conversation. Uh, before we go back to Sharon for uh, any uh, comments or views based on what has been raised here, do we have any mediator who would like to add to the conversation? And uh, this is as we uh, lead towards uh, closing uh, this particular session. Is there anyone else? Okay, so we'll invite Sharon and uh, uh, Julie for uh, their views. We've raised a couple of things to some of them tied to the presentation you've made or the experiences that we have here. So we'd be delighted to have um, your views, Sharon and uh, Julie. Thank you. Uh, well, I think at this point, there are so many pieces of this that I, I could go on and on and on. There's so many bits and pieces that we've been working through and, and finding different ways to address. Um, and I think where I'd like to leave um, conversation is congratulating everybody here on just how far things have gone at, at the stage that you're at and inviting each and every one of you, if you're interested in reaching out to us, I'm, I'm putting um, contact information into the chat. Um, we're happy to have these conversations because they're conversations that, as, as we've said, we've had some of them at various times throughout our own history, but they circle. Um, there, it, it is a cyclical thing when you're developing new practice and, and involved in culture change. And so very frequently we're engaging with similar questions yet again, but we may have different insights. And I know that we will learn from you as you reach out to, to talk to us about our experiences because yours will be different and will inform us. And it's something that um, is just mutual benefit uh, for us to be able to do that. So um, please do feel free to reach out to either one of us. I put my own um, email address in because mine's at Mediate BC, but uh, I, I know Julie will answer questions too. Though I'm going to pass it to her with having made that promise for her and let her, at, let her speak after that. <laughs> Thank you. I was actually going to say the same thing is that I think, um, first of all, uh, just having the conversations are the important parts and, and keep having them and inviting um, as many viewpoints as you can. And I do invite you to, um, uh, to reach out and, and keep having those conversations because it will enrich us. And I, I so appreciate um, hearing hearing the um, different issues and and that they're similar and yet probably some things that are unique to your communities and 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 um, yeah just congratulations on on that and and I um, thank you for your attention and questions and and uh, work towards um, creating mediation communities and processes that'll work for your communities okay Oh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Julie uh, Duan, who is the chair of uh, who is the chair of the Mediate BC, and most of all, uh, thank you for uh, accompanying uh, 
our speaker today, who is uh, Sharon Sutherland, Director of Strategic Innovation at Mediate uh, BC in Vancouver, Canada. And uh, Sharon, we are really grateful uh, that uh, you have uh, carried or brought along a gift. We love gifts. And uh, so we consider <laughs> that you brought us a gift. So we are really grateful because yes, this, this opportunity to really share insights, knowledge and experiences. And we are very, very grateful um, for that, uh, this particular opportunity. So colleagues, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us uh, in this particular session. And um, as I say that, I wish to kindly invite Mediator Diana or Yugi to give the vote of thanks. And then we will kindly request that uh, we can hear uh, from uh, Angela as uh, after uh, uh, we can hear from Angela if she has uh, anything to add uh, as a speaker today. And Angela, Wimbo Ataifa, Uko Mikononi. <laughs> so kindly Diana, and then we can have uh, Angela as uh, she also today gives us Wimbo Ataifa. Thank you. Diana, kindly. Mediator Diana. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, sorry, good morning, Sharon and Julie. And uh, good evening, my fellow mediators in Kenya, different parts of Kenya. This was an amazing, engaging session. Yes, another one of its kind. And uh, I'd like to thank each and every one uh, of you, especially our guests, uh, Sharon, and, Sharon and Julie. Really, really, really heartwarming sessions. I, I like something I like, it's something I had, yes, about the, the, the children, I mean, that was interesting for the, the children mediation services, yes, which you off, which you, which is being offered. I like the question that was asked and and uh, very, it's, it is engaging, it is. And it's something that some of us are looking forward to learning more, more so opening, looking for other opening, other opportunities to learn more as uh, our mediator, our fellow mediator, yes, from the LSK has told us that we, we should look, read, check, find information or, on our own, which is a good thing. But more so, thank you for the sites. Thank you for the openings. Thank you for, the, for every single discussion that you've had this evening from the time that I joined, which was uh, about nine, because I came from, a very, from, from very far. Yes, but it was, um, it's amazing. So we thank you for this. Uh, Amazing, amazing session, Sharon and Julie. And thank you so, so much. Uh, hello, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you so, so much, Angela. That was great. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Elaine, for, for that. Thank you, Bernard, for the questions. Thank you, Christina, for the input. Thank you. I have to, I have to put all the names. Thank you, Kimutai. That was great. And most, most, most of all, thank you so much, Wangari, our amazing Wangari. This has been something else. Really, really sincerely speaking, this is something else. I know each of us and the ones who are not here and the ones who have been here earlier up till this day are talking about it. This is, I, this is a great eye opener. This is a great opportunity. This is a great, great session. Thank you for the AIM week. We are really, really grateful. So, so grateful. So lovely evening to each and every one of you and lovely day to Sharon and Julie. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. So just before Angela comes in, uh, we we take this uh, opportunity to recognize, uh, let me say the, the one of the key people who has made this event to happen. And uh, that is uh, Sharon Sutherland. So Sharon Sutherland is, uh, one of that is a, one of the 2020 annual mediation advancement citation award recipient, which we offer as Wasiliana Hub uh, every year. There are uh, three other peers uh, who are not even in the mediation work who we have recognized this year and Sharon is um, the mediator. So our 2020 citation award recipients, we have engineer Audrey Alimilu Mulama, who's a founder of uh, Kakamega Environmental Conservation and beautification organization based in Kakamega. So her citation 
She's recogni recognized for her work and her organization's initiatives in mediating future disputes in the community by a focus on environmental conservation and economic livelihoods for the families. The second one is Dr. Mushiri Githiria. Quite a number of us would be familiar with him, an engineer and researcher and uh, of the School of Mines, Taita Taveta University. So his citation, he's recognized for his instrumental role in the development of the, of the mining industry strategy and capacity building of mediation and dispute resolution professionals. For the whole year of uh, 2020, he has been running training sessions with mediators to help us to understand how the mining industry works. The other one is uh, Paul N. Mirie, who is a mineral economist in the State Department of Mining, the Ministry of Petroleum and Mining in Kenya. Citation, recognized for his instrumental role in the development of the mining industry strategy and also capacity building of mediators and dispute resolution professionals to enable us to develop our strategy for the mining industry. So the fourth one is Sharon Sutherland, who's with us here today, Director of Strategic Innovation Mediate BC, Vancouver, Canada. She's a mediator, a lawyer, a trainer, and a game designer. And her citation, uh, Sharon is rec recognized for her advisory role to the African International Mediation Week 2020 and Strategy Conference. Uh, you'd be delighted to know that uh, probably 80% of the international sessions that we have hosted for these forums have been hooked up one way or the other. The string goes back to Sharon one way or the other. So wherever you are, can you please let's give her a clap wherever we, <laughs> yeah, wherever you are. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. And uh, the, the fifth recipient of uh, the 2020 uh, Citation Award is um, our very own uh, mediator, Sarah Atter. Uh, mediator Sarah Atter is uh, our virtual series moderator, and also she is the uh, uh, extractive sector lead. And uh, so, uh, Sarah Atter is recognized for her role in transitioning our in-person mediation community learning and networking forums to the virtual series in 2020. All this magic that you see and when we are running the, the, the show on the virtual platforms, um, Sarah has been uh, behind enabling this to happen throughout the year since March. So commendations to Sharon and uh, Sarah Atter who I know are in this conversation and uh, we look forward to being able to uh, recognize people who are doing great work that advances mediation and Sharon we are really grateful this is the first year we're doing the international uh, mediation week and it's truly been international so chair thank you for accompanying Sharon as she's carrying her citation so at least she has someone to help her to carry it back home <laughs> wonderful so Angela kindly your last words as you also give us the national anthem and uh, also Angela kindly pass our regards to your chair uh, Eric Theory, and uh, we will say that you are a good uh, messenger on his behalf. Thank you. Angela? Um, thank you very much. I must say I'm, I'm wowed and I'm very, very encouraged. Um, I came here thinking that uh, our committee is the youngest. We have the uh, so many uh, challenges to surmount, but I'm very invigorated. I'm very inspired by what what the future holds, because uh, this is a path that has already been chartered before. All we need to do is just consult where necessary and not be afraid to take bold steps. I'm very grateful for this opportunity and uh, congratulations to all the recipients. It was a pleasure meeting you. It's, it's such an honor being among such uh, great movers and shakers in the mediation world. It, it gives us hope and it gives us energy to give, uh, if we were giving 100%, now we'll give 150%. Because we see that our efforts are not in vain. It might look like uh, we are not moving fast enough, but uh, it's all about the consistency. If British Columbia have done it, if Nigeria have done it, we have no reason not to do it. So thank you very much to the organizers for this uh, opportunity. We hope that next year we, it's going to be a physical interaction because we hope by then we shall have gotten the COVID-19 vaccine. So I'm really looking forward to that. So um, on to the national anthem. I'll just uh, read the first verse in Kiswahili. E mungu nguvu yetu. Ilete baraka kwetu, haki iwe ngao na mlinzi, 
na tukae na undugu amani na uhuru raha tupate na ustawi thank you very much uh, back to you wangari You say back to me, uh, I think this is a great opportunity that we have to be able to say good night and good morning for uh, uh, everyone who's going to uh, get back to work and everyone who's going to sleep and freshen up. Uh, just as a reminder, tomorrow our, we start our session at 9 a.m. We have, a, uh, we have a, an, an, an open session where we will be discussing on uh, the development of tools that we can be able to provide to, or, or that can be available to uh, centers to be able to use. And these are tools that relate to special needs, addiction, family violence, online uh, mediation, ODR, and uh, also uh, mental health. So we invite you, this, is, uh, this will be a time for us to develop what you call co-creation so that we can be able to have um, from multiple, we, have, we bring in different skills as mediators. And then followed by that, we will have our next session at 11 a.m. to 12 uh, p.m. So nine, the first session is at 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. And then the second session is at 11 a.m. to 12 uh, p.m. That is East Africa time, where we will now be developing our action plan. And then we can be in, within the Strategy 20 conference. So thank you very much. Have a blessed night. And it was a delight to have you. Thank you very much, Sharon, Julie. And let's keep the communication going. Asante sana. God bless you. So Sharon, we can say good.